The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the sixth chapter of Luke's Gospel. We'll be reading this morning Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 17, reading through to verse 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we pray for ears to hear, ears that hear your words and not the ones I put in the way, eyes to see your way before us, hearts open to receive your call, and Lord, lives willing to respond. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Bill and Joe Johnson were a couple who were members of the church for as long as most folks could remember, though it had been several years since Bill had been able to attend services. The entire time I served as their pastor, Bill had been homebound unable to walk much further than the distance from his hospital bed in the living room to the bathroom down the hall or to a chair in the kitchen. It's his heart, Joe would tell me every time I came to visit them in their home in the cul-de-sac. Of course, Joe wasn't in spectacular health herself. She had smoked an awful lot in her younger eight years, and by the time I knew her, she was tethered either to an oxygen tank or to what seemed like miles of clear tubing that crisscrossed every room in her house. She was a sweet woman who loved her husband, loved her family, especially her little granddaughter, Jasmine. But it didn't come as a surprise to me when Joe called me one day to say that Bill had died. Between sort of gasping breaths, she told me about how Bill had gone the way everyone should want to have to go, at home, surrounded by her and their family. And then she asked if I wouldn't mind if I would do the funeral. And of course I said yes. So when the day came, we had the, the, the service there at the funeral home in its chapel, nothing too out of the ordinary. I prayed, read some scripture, put a few words together, for Bill's family, all while there were a few recorded hymns woven in. And afterwards, we all processed to the cemetery. And it was there, at the graveside, where I made several mistakes that I felt bad about for weeks afterwards. Now, in case you don't know this, I have trouble with names. I really do. Uh, if I ask you your name, it's not because I don't know you or don't like you. Frankly, it's because I just can't, I can't make my brain remember names. I have a genuinely difficult time with names. It seems to be worse as I get older, but it also seems to be worse whenever I have to remember couples or, or family names. And it's really bad when I have to remember couples whose names are quite similar, like Bill and Joe. 
I had trouble with that the first time I met them, but I thought that I was over it. And then we came to Bill's graveside service, where I repeatedly said things like, Today we lay Joe's body in the ground. Today, Joe may no longer be with us, but Joe's death is only a temporary... Over and over, every time I, I write it all down now. But every time I was supposed to say Bill, I said Joe. I bet I told myself a thousand times, probably in the car on the way to the cemetery, don't switch the two. But I did every single time. I felt awful. Now, you all have never done anything like that, right? Mix your words up, wind up saying something that's the right opposite of what you intended to say. You've never done that, right? Well, if you have, I have. I do. I did then. And I'm beginning to think that maybe, maybe Jesus did too. Or at least folks like Luke. Folks like Luke did when they were writing all the stuff down that Jesus said and did at least a a generation uh, later. I mean, that would make sense to me to get it backwards. After all, it's hard to keep the facts straight and all the quotes exactly right 40 or 50 years later. Think about it. Every Thanksgiving, sitting around the table, somebody tells that same story. They tell every year, but it's always just a a little different. And before long, somebody was able to fly or something crazy happens. It's hard to keep all the details straight. You just want to raise your hand and stand up and say, that's not how I remember it. Maybe. I could understand if it was Luke that got it twisted a bit. But if you've read Luke's gospel, you know how unlikely that is. Luke starts in the very opening lines to tell us that he's meticulously set out to write a detailed account. He's done his research. He's spoken with eyewitnesses. Luke was likely palling around with Paul, ran into Peter, some of the other apostles like James, and no doubt wrote down what they had to say. So I really doubt that it's Luke who got his words mixed up. So maybe, maybe it was Jesus who misspoke. Maybe Jesus meant to say one thing and actually said another. And I can't blame him if he did. Because if you read the chapters and verses leading up to our passage this morning, you'll see that Jesus is no slouch. That he has a full itinerary with little time to rest and no coffee. None. After his baptism, after his trials in the desert, Jesus begins right away with a teaching ministry that begins back in Galilee in chapter 4, goes around back to his home in Nazareth where they try to throw him off a cliff. And then he's back in the synagogues in Judea, followed by what we saw last week, this lakeside lecture from a boat. All of this is happening. And in the meantime, it seems like Jesus can't move from one place to another without people coming and asking him questions. At least twice he had to answer, according to Luke, questions about fasting or Sabbath. That's a lot of teaching. That's a lot of answering questions. A lot of time and energy going to telling people about the kingdom of God. That alone might be enough to cause someone to get their words backwards. To have a slip of the tongue. But Jesus is doing even more than just teaching. He's also healing a number of people. He cast out an unclean spirit in a man in Capernaum. He healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law of a dangerous fever. And before he can even say, bye, see you later, before he can get out the door, the word has spread and there's a line formed. And Luke tells us all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of diseases brought them to Jesus and he laid his hands on them and cured them. He did all that. And then Luke sort of just says matter of factly, oh, and he cast out some demons, not to mention this miraculous catch of fish which afterwards, Jesus cleanses a leper, heals a paralytic, fixes a man's withered hand. And in the verses at the very beginning of our text this morning, Luke says, Many had come to him to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. That is no small thing. Jesus has been teaching and now he's healing, that too is enough to wear anybody out, to knock your tongue loose, 
But that's not all Jesus does. He does even still more. Because in the midst of his teaching and his healing and his exercising, and that's exorcising of demons, not... In the midst of all of that, he calls disciples. He calls Levi away from the tax booth, calls James and John, Peter and Andrew away from the fishing boats. No, I wouldn't blame Jesus one bit if he got his words crossed up. If he said one thing, but meant the right opposite. To tell you the truth, I sort of hope that's what happened. Otherwise, I'll have to deal with what Luke tells us Jesus says in this passage. And honestly, I don't want to. Honestly, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It seems backwards, upside down, inside out. What does Jesus say? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, defame you. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full now. Woe to you who are laughing. Woe to all who speak well of you. That's backwards, isn't it? It just doesn't sound right. Maybe Jesus is just tired and has his words all twisted. Here, see if this doesn't sound a little bit better, more natural. Woe to you who are poor. Woe to you who are hungry. Woe to you who weep. Woe to you when people hate you, exclude you, revile you, and defame you. Blessed are you who are rich. Blessed are you who are full now. Blessed you who are laughing now. Blessed are you when people speak well of you. That sounds right, doesn't it? That makes more sense. Surely, that's what Jesus meant. Because that makes a lot more sense. I mean, of course, we would likely say, woe to those who are poor and hungry. Because they've probably done something to put themselves in that position, right? Maybe they're lazy. Maybe they're not good with money. Maybe they just make bad decisions all the time, wind up with growling stomachs and empty accounts. Surely they wouldn't be poor because of something out of their control, right? Woe to the poor. That makes sense more sense. And of course we'd say, woe to those who weep now, because you've been to the same kinds of funerals that I have. You know the ones where folks are just falling all over each other, crying, crying and carrying on, covering the church parking lot in cigarette butts and snuff spit. The sort of, sort of funerals where they just, oh, it looks like a big put on, a big production, an emotionally overdrawn show. Woe to them because they, they don't know how to act now that grandma's gone, right? Woe to them because they ought not to be crying if they know where their loved one is gone when they die, right? Woe to those who weep now because if they had just stayed out of trouble, they wouldn't be in the situation to cause them to cry. Woe to those who weep now because if they had just paid the bill on time, the light wouldn't be cut off. Woe to those who weep now. Because if they had just done what they were supposed to do, they'd have nothing to weep about, right? Woe to those who are hated, excluded, reviled, and defamed. Because it sure is awful to be one of them. After all, no one hates another person simply because of some characteristic they have no control over, right? No one hates another person because of something as involuntary as the color of their skin, the place of their birth, the language they speak, or their very biology, right? Nobody hates somebody for those reasons, right? No one has ever been excluded because of who they are, reviled on account of things beyond their control, defamed or turned away because they were seeking to do something good, something right, something just, Something from a place of love. No one's ever been reviled or excluded, rejected because of that. Have they? Maybe the revised blessings make a bit more sense. After all, I've come to learn that people prefer to be told positive things over negative things. So, blessed are the rich. Now that makes sense to me, right? Right? I mean, you work hard, you earn a good living, you buy some nice things, save up some money, invest, you get rich. Wealth is a blessing, right? I mean, it's not like folks get rich by exploiting those with little to give, do they? 
It's not like some of the richest people in the world keep most of their money while millions of people go hungry, do they? Even so, surely Jesus isn't talking about those kind of rich folks anyway, right? Surely he'd have to be talking about those rich folks who do good things, who give some of their money to charity, those rich folks who only own a few homes and four sports cars and only go on three vacations and pay their employees just enough so that they can have the luxury of working a second job, right? Blessed are the good rich. Maybe that's what Jesus meant. Blessed are those who are full now. Well, that just makes all kinds of sense to me. Because, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but I like food. And I don't like just a little bit of food. I have been known to make decisions at supper and dinner about what I'm going to eat based on the serving size of the food. I mean, I like it. There are few things in this world quite as nice as a good meal that fills you up just right. And I was right in the middle of a good blessing like that a few weeks ago. I was coming home from Atlanta from a week-long writing workshop when I decided to stop at a Chick-fil-A for lunch. Now, I'm no fool. I didn't stop, you know, close enough to Atlanta where the traffic is always thick as hair on a squirrel. I decided to come a little on further down I-20. But it was still in Eastern time, about 2.30. And I went to pull in this Chick-fil-A. And friends, if there is a fast food place that could be blessed, it's them. 2.30. And there's still a line of cars wrapped around that building of Jesus' chicken. Inside, three lines at the counter. I ordered my food, I got my drink, and I sat down waiting for my blessing to come to my table. They'll bring it to your table. They don't do that at McDonald's. They'll bring it to your table. And that's when I saw her. Actually, I saw her when I pulled into the parking lot. She got out of the minivan in front of me. An older woman dressed in a dark sort of dress as she wobbled, as she walked. I remember seeing a piece of paper in her hand. And as I sat at that table waiting for my chicken sandwich, I walked, watched her walk up to people in line, showing them that piece of paper, never saying a word, just showing them the piece of paper. And each one shook their head, just sort of looked at their phone at the wall, trying to ignore her, or just shrugged their shoulders. I overheard a couple of the girls behind the counter say something about calling the police. But the woman had slipped out the door and was walking across the street to the Burger King. I heard one man whom she had approached say, I doubt she didn't even speak English because she sure couldn't write it good. The irony was lost on him. And then he said, she ought to find a mosque or something if she's really hungry. Let them give her some food. I guess she, he assumed she was Muslim because of the way she looked. Oh well. Blessed are those who are full now, right? You know, now that I think about it, maybe, maybe Jesus didn't have a slip of the tongue. Maybe he really didn't mean it when he said, blessed are the poor. Blessed are you who are poor, who are hungry now, you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you. Because those kinds of folks have nothing left to hold on to but God. There's no one left to feed them. No one left to dry their tears, to love them, include them, hold them up, and cherish them but God. And maybe Jesus actually meant it when he said, Woe to you who are rich, who are full now, who are laughing now. Woe to you when all speak well of you. Because far too often those who are rich get that way because they hold too tightly to what they have while seeking more from those who have less. Because far too often those who are full don't want to know where their food comes from and who might actually be starving for the food they scrape down the disposal. Because far too often those who are laughing don't get that the joke is on someone else. That their comfort is at the expense of someone else. 
that when others speak well of you, they will just as surely speak ill of you the moment you do or say one thing out of line with their way of thinking. Woe to them, because the only one they have left to feed them, to dry their tears, to love them, is themselves. Maybe Jesus didn't get his words mixed up. Maybe we've got this world mixed up. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come now with your words in the air, Lord, help them to land on our hearts, to change us more into the likeness of your Son, more into your likeness, so that we may understand, Lord, the difference between those who are blessed and those, Lord, to whom you say, woe. Lord, help us now to understand where we are, on what side of that line we may be now. And Lord, where you call us, and how you call us to transform our lives, or so that we may be among those who are called blessed. So Lord, move in our midst this morning. Speak to us, reveal to us who you are, and how you would have us to respond to your presence this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.